Ah, come on now. Somebody's got to be ready um, after all of that today, after graduates, after praying over a building, after all those things. So we've been talking about treasure. We talked about the first week, contentment. Uh, listen, if we can't be content, then there's not anything going to be nice enough for us to enjoy anyway. Contentment begins to allow us to have the understanding of what it is to enjoy the things that we have and not fret over the things that we don't. And so contentment, we talked about the next week, giving, and, and Michael uh, preached that. He did an outstanding job. If you didn't hear that one, you need to go back and listen to it. Um, and then we talked about God's blessings, the blessings of God, and then we talked about children last week. Now, here's one of the things that happens. <clears throat> we get into church, and we start talking about kids and all that stuff, and, and somewhere, for some reason, we begin to, well, that just didn't apply in my house. Maybe it doesn't apply because you haven't applied it. Um, and I'm not saying, listen, I, I'm not saying that I did everything perfect. I didn't. You can just ask Tiffany. She'll go, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm glad she didn't say amen or any of those things right there. It makes me feel a little better. But the point is, is I'm not saying that we, we do it right all the time. What we do, though, is we're striving. We're striving to do it the way Christ has called us to do it. So don't turn me off and say, well, I don't know. Pastor Scott, that's kind of harsh. Well, I don't. Listen and allow the voice of the Lord to speak to you. And he'll speak to you this morning through the word. So we talk about children, but here's, here's the question. What's a treasure? What's a treasure? Now, like I said, I, I used this illustration, I think, last week, that um, wives, if your husband throws his clothes in the dirty clothes hamper instead of in the floor, to you, that's a treasure. I'm like, yay, he's growing up 50 years later. Um, <laughs> His mama couldn't teach him, but I did. No, uh, anyway. Uh, but the, the thing is, is what's a treasure? Now, there's a lot of things that we can identify as treasure. We've identified some already in, in this series, and we talked about children being a treasure. But let me ask this, kind of this question. Is it a treasure if it can't, if it can't be enjoyed or if you can't enjoy it? The Bible talks about his, his blessings are, don't bring sorrow. They don't bring grief to us. So I'm going to tell you something, if you, if you can't enjoy it, then it's not a treasure. A treasure ought to be enjoyed. A treasure ought to be enjoyed. So let's talk about your children. Because <laughs> treasures ought to be enjoyed. But there's things that we've got to do, there's steps we've got to take for us to see that in our lives. Psalms, 120, uh, Psalms 127, 3 through 5, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb is a reward. Now listen, don't, don't go quiet on me. The last several weeks, y'all have done really good. Listen, if you hear something you like, mmm, mmm. Okay, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. And that has to do, when it says speaking with their enemies in the gate, what it has to do is negotiating, but also has the place of being able to correspond because the gate speaks of government, but it also speaks of, of, of order and how those things work. And he says when they speak in the gate, they'll not be ashamed. Um, but so as we look at this, there's several things that I want us to look at. One, heritage, as I talked last week, uh, heritage is to be treasured. Um, it should be cherished or loved, prized, and appreciated. Um, and so if our children are a heritage, like I said, it's kind of, it's kind of backwards for us, right? Because when we think of an inheritance, we think of parents giving an inheritance to their children. But the Bible says that children are an inheritance to the parents. That's how good our God is to us. Their heritage. And then he, says, then he goes on to say that they're a reward. In other words, they're a blessing. They, and they need to be celebrated. But then the verse 4, which is really where I want to spend most of my thought process today, is like this. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Arrows, um, you aim them. You aim an arrow. An arrow, if I, if I had an arrow in my hand, the only value that it might have is if I could throw it at you or hit you with it. But it doesn't really, that's not what its intent, right? Its intent is to be put in a bow and an archer takes that and with their skill, their developed skill, they can hit the bullseye. With a developed skill, they can, they can hit an, an animal or they can hit a, a target or whatever it happens to be. And so arrows, so... This is the thing about arrows. Arrows are not born, but they're made. You realize that they, they have to be grafted. They have to be fashioned. And so uh, when we talk about our children, we have to fashion them. 
I realize some of, some of our kids, they, they have a, a different, my three kids, they have three different dispositions on life. Riley, most likely me, is the most anointed. <laughs> no. Man, y'all got to lighten up for something or I'm going to start running around this place. Uh, no, no. the thing is, is we, 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 but you know something? They all had to be fashioned. They all had to be made. They all had to be taught. They all had to be grafted in a particular way. And so arrows are not born, but they're made, they're fashioned. Arrows are dependent on another force to be useful. You know how they're used? When they're, put, when they're most used and the most effective, when they're put in a bow. Right? So, so the thing that we know about arrows is that, that they are dependent. They need, they need to be shot or they need to be directed. They need to be directed. Well, I don't want to force my kids. The world's going to force and they don't care if you like it or not. So I'm not saying we have to force them. But I think we've, we better learn to lead them. And to be most effective, arrows need to be sharpened. They need to be sharpened. The end of that thing. And so, this morning as we look at these, this as arrows in the, in the hand of a warrior, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Father, I just thank you for this day, and I ask that in these few moments that you would anoint us. Lord, anoint me, anoint those that would hear today. Father, I pray that you would open up our understanding and Lord, would you burn your word in our heart today? Lord, we thank you for it. Will you pray this after me? Father, open up my understanding. Write your word on my heart. Give me the courage and the obedience to follow you completely. And everybody that believed it said, Amen. So let me take, I'm going to take some scriptures and, and I want to use it to begin to form uh, the thoughts that I want to go with this morning and, and then we'll get to the end and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this together. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, Moses writing and instructing the Israelites through, from God, he, Moses makes this to them, says this to them, this is the command, the statute and ordinances, the Lord your God has instructed me to teach you. So that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Remember, they're about to go into the promised land. God has promised them a land that flows with milk and honey. And so now he's beginning to give them the instructions of how they should live. And he says, do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I am giving you. You, your son, and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Uh, listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. That's right. Come on, somebody. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Say that with me. Repeat them to your children. Um, he goes on to say, talk about them when you sit up in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead, write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you a land with large and beautiful cities that you would not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, wells dug that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Right, so you get the picture. I read all that because I wanted you to get this picture. He's saying to them, I want you, when you get up, I want you to talk about it. When you lie down, I want you to talk about it. When you're walking along the road, talk about it. Wherever you go, whatever you do, write it on the doorpost of your home. Write it on the gates so that when you're walking out the gates of your home, that you, you're, you're reminded, follow the Lord God with all my heart. Love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to do these things and I'm going to repeat them. 
Now, that, that right there is a, is a parenting tip number one. You're going to have to be ready to repeat yourself. Amen. And all the spouses said, <laughs> no, <laughs> all the wives said, uh, the, you have to repeat. And don't get mad. Well, well, God continually repeats it to us. Yes. And so there's nothing wrong with repeating it. Don't get frustrated. You say, this is the way we're going to live. This is, this is how we're going to live. This is what we're going to do. We don't do it like that anymore. We do it like this now. And we're going to repeat it. But I, I, I read all of that to come to one more verse. And, and a lot of times I don't like doing this. But go to Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through, 6 through 13. They're going to give this to you. Because here's Deuteronomy. Here's Moses. And he, uh, he's giving the instructions to the Israelites. We remember just a few weeks ago, we talked about Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho. Joshua is the lead. He becomes the leader. Moses is not able to go into the promised land because he had sinned. He, had done, he didn't do what God exactly told him to do. And so God didn't allow him to go into the promised land. So Joshua comes. But in Judges chapter 2, I want you to hear what this says. Joshua sent the people away, and the Israelites went to the possessions of the land, each to his own inheritance. What is it talking about? He's talking about he's sending them away to, the, to their promised land, the, the land that had been promised to them by God. That's where he's sending them, to their promises. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath, Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of uh, Mount Gaash. Or Gaash. Uh, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors after them, and get this, verse 10, after them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. All right, so I'm, I'm trying to develop a picture or graft a picture here. God gives them a command. Train your kids. We'll, 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 we'll reduce it to that for the sake of time. Train your kids. We see then, Joshua comes in, they, they go into the promised land, all these awesome things. The Jericho Falls, you remember all the things that God did for them in that, and it says, then there came a generation after Joshua's generation. Now, we're talking uh, approximately anywhere between 30 to 50 years. In fact, I'd say 50 is probably the longest. I'm thinking it's about 30 years. Uh, and in that short a period of time, it says there rose up another generation that, knew, that, that did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. It's sad commentary of Israel. And of course, we can sit right here and we can throw rocks at them all we want to. But if we're not careful, they're going to bounce back and hit us. Because I'm going to tell you something. You want to know why the U.S. is in the place we're in today? Because the church didn't do what God has called us and commanded us to do. As a whole, there are pockets. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to be critical of that. I'm just saying, listen, the truth is, the same thing that happened to the Israelites is the same thing that we can look at the church today and say, hey, listen, we are not following God wholeheartedly. So where is the, where's the break? Where, what's happened in all of this? See, God does not give instructions to us to be self-serving to Him. Do you realize, we, we don't serve an egomaniac, evil, egomaniac God. Do you get that? He doesn't, he doesn't say, don't do this, just so, he can, just so he can say, I'm bigger than you, don't do it. He, that's not the way God is toward us. It says this, he, he does not give us commands to be a tyrant or a dictator or to manipulate us. His commands lead us to his blessings, but he wants to establish his kingdom in us and through us. He wants to have a relationship with us to establish his culture or his kingdom in the earth. So when he begins to give, when he gives us his word, he doesn't give us his word just so, so that we have something that's, uh, that's irritating and difficult. He gives us his word so that we know how to walk and how to live in this life. 
So we go to the Old Testament, we, and, and uh, Paul would write this uh, in, in 1 Corinthians. He says that, that the, our elders, our forefathers, they are examples to us. The Old Testament's an example to us. And so we look at it today as an example to us. So what happened? Why was there a disconnect between Joshua's generation and the next generation? What happened in that? And I'm going to... My thought is, or, or let, me, let me state my thought in this, is that I believe that somewhere along the line, they quit repeating and teaching, and it didn't become important, and they realized, oh, some of these bad things aren't going to really happen. Well, don't worry about it today, and then they didn't worry about it the next day, and they didn't worry about it the next day, and then 30 years later, they look at it, and what's happened? I made this statement last week. You know, we, we, can, we can fuss and complain about this generation, but you don't know who's the one that allowed them to be that way? us we have to create it by by whatever it is because of uh our lackadaisicalness because uh we 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 don't want to be like our parents and we're not we're worse than they were (laughs) but hear me this morning see today we live in such a different social climate don't we how many of you remember this? When you were growing up, you don't have to be 50, but you're fairly close to my age. I'm not talking about these young bucks over here. But if you're close to my age, do you ever remember, did, did it, your neighbors ever get on to you? Your parents, friends, say, hey, you don't do that, right? You don't see that today because you don't talk to my kid like that. They're over here acting like a fool, man. They're, being, they're running out in the middle of the street. Okay, go ahead, play. Right? We wouldn't do, but that's, it, we live in such a different social climate. And, I, and because of it, even the church is affected by it. And we have to be aware of it. See, I, I'll talk this morning about children just a little bit. And some of you will turn me off just because, oh, my kid's not like that. And I'm not saying all the kids are exactly like this. I'm just saying, listen, if we don't understand and recognize what God wants us to do and how we should live, then what happens is it may not be our generation. It may not even be the next generation. But there will be another generation that rises up and they know not the things of God or the works of God. And I'm saying, not on my watch. And so, as we look at our client, I mean, today it seems like everything is on the teachers. It's the teacher's fault. Well, if the school was better and, that, and all these things, it's not the student. It's not the student that's been given 47 chances to turn their paper in and they... Well, they shouldn't get to see. And I, I'm not here to fuss about that. I'm just using that as an illustration or as a thought this morning. Um... I, I don't know about you, but this way it was in, in, when I was growing up. When I growed up. If I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home. And I don't ever remember going, well, won't you call them and ask them what? And it wasn't, it, there was no, and of course, I have to be real honest with you. I didn't get in trouble a whole lot. You don't know one reason why? Because my daddy, when he said this is the way it was going to be, that's the way it was going to be. <laughs> and i like, hey, I'm smart enough. I was smart at fairly young age to realize, hey, if I don't do this, everything's good on the south side. <laughs> if I do this, <laughs> right, right? And so, um, but society and everything that happens is working and fighting against the family. See, the world standard is to reduce everyone to the same level and sadly, it's been accepted in the church. And now listen, I'm not talking about educational level, intellect. I'm not talking about any of those things. It's just like, hey, if we just bring them all together and we're just a hodgepodge, then, it, then every, you know, it's okay. But I I say that because it, it's, a, it's an attack, it's a scheme of the enemy against the church, against us as families, uh, against those things. And so understand this morning, as, as we begin to look at this, it's even, if we're not careful, we can accept it in the church. We settle um, for babysitting in the nursery instead of ministry in the nursery. Well, they're just babies. No, they're not just babies. They, those are chi- children, those are child of the Most High. And they got quicker access than you and I do. <laughs> and so, it's not, we don't want to just babysit. We want to do ministry. I realize, I don't want to get real specific and all that, but do you understand me this morning? Yeah. It's a fight. We, wanna, we want to play 
instead of teaching to pray. And I, I think, we, you know, last week we had a family Sunday and we did some silly games and all that stuff. And, and we did that um, just to show you some of the things going on in our children's ministry and some of those things. And I realized we've got to, we've got to mix it in and all that stuff. But here's the, here, here comes the bottom line. And, and this, was, this was when I was in youth ministry. We didn't do a lot of stuff because I'm like, I don't want to leave here and wonder where's the basketball. And and I was probably a little goofy and a little harsh in some of that. Don't say amen. Uh, but the, the thing is, is we, we want to play instead of teaching them to pray. Um, we we want to promote heroes instead of a savior. And so we've got to raise the standard. Uh, you know something? David tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant. He tried to bring it back to Israel. And he thought, man, I've got a great idea. We're going we're gonna to pimp this right. Sorry, I just had to use that one time. It was, it was, it had been instructed by Moses that when they carried the ark, it'd be carried by men, it'd be carried on their shoulders, and they would, they would walk it. But David thought, hey, we'll get this cart, we'll soup it all up, put these oxen on it, and they'll bring it in, and we'll make this be so cool. And they bring it, they come to the threshing floor. And the man reaches, and he wasn't, even, he wasn't even trying to do anything wrong. He was just trying to make sure it didn't fall. And he touched it, and, and God killed him. Because God had said, if anybody touches it, they're going to die. And David gets mad. God, why? That was the awesomest ride you've ever had. And he had to go back, and he had to read the instructions. And you know what he did the next time? He put it on the shoulders of men. And they carried the anointing into Jerusalem like it was supposed to be done. See, we've got to raise the standard. We've got to teach. We've got to train. Well, well, well that's, just not, that's just not relevant. Well, listen, the Word of God is relevant to everything that we are in today. And everything that we'll face today, it's relevant to us. If we'll take it and begin to apply it. Well, I, I, I'm telling you this morning that if our children are going to be a treasure, then Proverbs 22, 6 becomes... Our motto, our our mantra, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Isn't it crazy um, what it takes to raise kids today? I mean, the money, the time. You know, Riker gets gets mad at us sometimes. Well, well, why why don't you help me more with, with school? I'm like, hey, listen here, girl. I went and got mine. You go get yours. (laughs) <laughs> should have been better at basketball. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean, but it's like, well, why don't you just give me everything? And, and we want to be a benefit and we want to be a blessing, but at the same time, there's, there's a, a piece of that. I mean, it's just, it's expensive. I mean, I can't imagine. Goodness gracious, man, just, you just need a pasture and say, go eat the, go eat the grass. Cut out the middle, man. They like hamburgers. Just cut out the middle, man. Go eat the grass. <laughs> anyway, uh, but... But if children are a heritage, then I think that we need to learn how to treasure them. If they are a treasure to us, we better recognize that we are stewards of them to God. So, so why, do we, why do we train them up? And I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, just because of the sake of time this morning. One, we train them up to honor God. Yes. We honor God, we honor His Word. We're going to train them up. Now, now listen, if you read this, Proverbs 22, 6, it doesn't even say parents. It just says, train up a child in the way that he should go. So we could, as a church, could, we could let that go, train up every child. Train up a child in the way that he should go. Why don't we train them? To honor God. Um, another thing is to be a blessing to you and to them. I want, I want to enjoy my kids. You know how you do it? Train them up. They'll be a blessing to you, and they'll be a blessing to themselves. Um, to, to establish God's kingdom in our lives. That's why we train them up, to establish God's kingdom. How are we going to do that? Well, they've got to know what the kingdom of God is all about. We're going to establish His culture in our lives. Another thing is to be an influence to others. To be an influence. We use the word in our, in our vision statement, destiny is a New Testament church impacting our community. We use the word impact, but it's to be an influence, a positive influence, a good influence, a godly influence. Um, the other reason that we, or another reason that we train up is to spread the knowledge of God. Why? Jesus said to his disciples, go make disciples. Disciples. 
We're going to spread. Why, why do we train them up? To spread the knowledge. And then to increase or to extend God's kingdom. That's why we train them up. So, so what are we training them up to know? Well, we want to train them up, first of all, first and foremost, to know God. They may not know, they may not know uh, reading and writing and arithmetic. But if they know God, if they know God, the most important thing, because you know someone when they stand before, when, when we stand before the Lord, he's not going to say, we're not going to say, but God, I was the valedictorian. But God, I made a million dollars. But God, I won the Super Bowl with my, my catch in the end zone. What's well, it going to come down to? Who do you know? Who do you know? And if we don't teach them and train them and help them to know who God is, then shame on us. But I'm telling you, one of the reasons we're facing some of the situations is because the church has been poor in making him known and allowing him to be known to our sons and our daughters. So they need to learn to hear the voice of God. They need to submit to his will and to his ways and to know the, the, principles, the, king, the principles of the kingdom. So we have to train them to know God. Um, we have to discipline. That's that fashion or that develop part. I was talking about arrows aren't, arrows aren't um, born, they're made. We have to fashion, we have to discipline them. Now, a lot of times when we think of discipline, we automatically start thinking about getting a spanking. That's not discipline. That's called punishment. Now, they do go hand in hand if done correctly. They do go hand in hand. But I can discipline someone without no, with, with no punishment in, intended. But discipline, if we don't train our sons and our daughters, if we don't discipline them, the writer of Hebrews says this, that you're, you're no better than an illegitimate child. So if we don't discipline our sons and our daughters, then we're just making them illegitimate. Well, that's, that, that sounds kind of harsh. It's not me. That's what the Word of God says to us. And so we have to discipline. We have to learn to discipline. We have to educate. In other words, we've got to sharpen. We've got to sharpen that arrow. And then we've got to direct them. We've got to direct them. See, we recognize their strengths and their weaknesses. We've got to give them opportunities and things. But you know something? There comes a point we've got, we got to shoot that arrow. So we've got to direct them. Where am I directing them? Well, I'm directing them to know God. I'm directing them to, to know discipline. I mean, we can, get, we can get real practical here. We, can, we need to discipline them how, how they manage their checkbook. Well, they do that at school. If you're waiting on the school to do it, I'm telling you right now, if you've been in the classroom today, you don't know why there's no education because there's no discipline. Teachers are so frustrated. And I know this because I, I, I've got a son that's a teacher. Frustrated. Kids come in, do whatever they want to do and how they want to do it. And you send a referral to the office and they just don't send us any more referrals. You're like, what? If I can't discipline in the classroom, I can't educate. And if I can't educate, then what am I doing? Just keep sending me your paycheck. <laughs> right? But it takes discipline to bring, bring about an education. And so those are the things that we've got to do. See, if we fail to train them, if we fail to train them up, we, then they don't know God. They will not be an influence. They will be directionless, and they will be illegitimate. That's what, that's what happened if we fail. Now listen, I, I want to go back and say this, because I need you to hear me. I, I, I was not perfect. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. In fact, I, I'll be real honest with you. As I've, as I've walked through this the last two weeks, I've repented more than I've said amen. Lord, forgive me for that. Man, did I miss an opportunity there. Man, I wish I would have done that better. Man. And I can't, so I'm coming to you today and going, come on, you get it right. <laughs> Um, see, it's our responsibility as parents and as a church. You and I have to be determined to raise godly children. It has to be intentional. Don't, don't, don't think it's going to happen by osmosis. Don't think it's going to happen just, well, they have a great youth ministry. We, we do have a great youth ministry here. We have a great children's ministry here. We have, we have, but don't think, well, if they hear pastor, that'll be enough. No, it's not enough. One hour a week and they'll leave here and watch trash on TV longer than that. And I, I'm not trying to get on the TV kick. I'm just trying to tell you, listen. 
Don't, don't think that we're just going to get it just because, well, we're good people and we did really nice things. If we don't train them up and if we're not intentional, if we're not determined, uh, then, then it's not, it's not going to happen. It's our responsibility. We have to be an example. We have to be an example. Hey, I, I'll just say this. and I, I won't look at anybody because I don't think it happens here. Don't go to church. Drop your kids off and leave. Bad example. Why? Because what you're saying is, is what you're doing is more important than what I'm going to do. And I realize things happen. I, I, I'm not trying to be mean or harsh about it. I'm just telling you this. That's a bad example. It's like saying, you, you, need, to, you need to obey the police. You stupid policeman, why did you pull me? Well, what did you just teach? What did you just communicate? Opposite of what you said. And so now what you're doing, you're causing frustration. How, how am I supposed to do this? How can I call him an idiot and still obey? Listen. So we have to be an example. Doesn't mean we're always perfect. I'm, I wasn't. Um, the next thing that is our responsibility is pray, 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 pray. <laughs> Come on now, pray, <laughs> right? And you make that into a song or a dance or something. Pray. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you have to, we have to rely on God. Because you and I are not smart enough. We're not educated enough to know everything that's going on. We need God to help us. And the only way we're going to train them up to follow after God is if we pray and we pursue Him and we seek after Him. Well, I don't like to pray. It's hard. It feels like when I pray, nothing happens. Well, it's probably because you don't pray enough. Now, I'm not saying your prayers are answered according to the quantitative amounts that you pray. I'm just saying this. We've got to pray. And continue to pray. And so, we have to rely completely on God to help us. Uh, here's something else. Learn to be a good parent. You want, you want to know one reason I'm a good parent? Because I married a good parent. Well, she would become a good parent. I didn't marry a good parent. She wasn't a parent when we got married, okay? Just want you to know, just want you to know that. The most of the stuff that I've learned I, growing up, and then the things that Tiffany taught me. And that we, we argued, fought, and, and like, I don't know. I was, eh. You're right. But you can learn to be a good parent if you want to bad enough. Do you want, to be, do you want your children to be blessings to you? Then why don't you learn? And I'll, I'll say this. You, you have to learn to be disciplined. Um, rise above the world's philosophies and standards. I'll end up mentioning somebody's name and get somebody else in trouble or somebody be mad at me, which doesn't really matter if they're mad at me. But the point is this, is, is don't go and go to the bookstore and go, oh, there's, there's one. Know who you're reading and know who they are. Know the stuff that they're dishing out. Well, this person's really popular. Well, there's more people going to hell than are to heaven. That's the most popular choice. I don't think that's the way I'm going to determine this. I'm going to learn. I'm going to read. I'm going to study. I'm going to get around parents, good parents. And I'm going to ask them to help me. I'm going to ask them, hey, I'm having this problem with Sammy. And she always acts like this. I don't know why it's like, like this. But can you help me? I'll say, first of all, Nikki, quit doing that. And, uh, <laughs> and she won't keep doing that. No, I'm playing. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is we can learn. You and I can learn. Why? Because we got to train them up. Why do we need them to train them up? Because we want them, they're a treasure to us. And because they're a treasure to us, because I cherish them and I love them, and I want them to know the blessings and the things of God, guess what? I'm going to train them up. It's not easy, it's difficult. But if we're going to do what God, if we'll do what God tells us to do, there's blessing. And he said, if you'll be obedient to these things, there's going to be blessing. Remember we read it in Deuteronomy the other day, Deuteronomy 28. You'll be blessed going in and going out. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country. The, you, your children will be blessed. Your cattle will be blessed. Everything's going to be blessed. Why? Because you're obedient. You follow what he said. And so this morning as we come to the close on treasure, our children are our greatest treasure. Let them carry 
let them carry on what we've entrusted to them and planted them and passed the baton and let them go farther and do greater things than we could have ever done because they've stood on our shoulders and we've helped push them forward. Treasure. Father, I just thank you for today. Lord, help us to hear with a spiritual ear. Lord, help us to see with spiritual eyes and give us understanding in your precious name. Amen.